Heidi. Thank you, ladies. It's great being in the house of the Lord this morning and being able to enjoy the fellowship and being changed by the Word of God. Why don't you do me a favor, folks? We always like to honor the Word of God by standing as we read it. If you would stand along with me, we are going to read together Matthew, the 26th chapter. You can follow that on the PowerPoint or one of the Pew Bibles, pull it out, or if you've brought your own or you have an electronic device you'd like to use, that's all good. Matthew 26 and verses 36 through 46. It says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And one more verse, Romans, the eighth chapter. And we'll read together verse 26. I might even throw verse 27 in for good measure. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says, Likewise the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Father, we ask today that you would bless the preaching of your word. And Father, we are quite sincere when we say that we are here to exercise our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Not religion, not something that is without power, but Father, we pray for your power to fall today as the word of God goes forth. Change us, encourage your people. Might we understand even better your purposes for our lives. Thank you that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake, amen. You can be seated, folks. As you know, I, I shared in uh, Sunday school, some of you heard me say this, it is a frustrating thing sometimes being a pastor and having about 10 sermons on my heart and mind that I want to teach all at once. And uh, we are right now paralleling what we are doing on Wednesday night as we look at Max Licato's 
series, a 12-week series on unshakable hope, and we have been moving through that. This past Wednesday, we looked at prayer, and today we notice very quickly that Christ is in the Garden of Gethsemane. I asked the Lord to help me to relate to that in a small way all the time. As we see his deity, his godlikeness, but as we also see his humanity in its purest form, as he feared, as he sought friendship, as he sought encouragement, but especially as he sought the prayers of those who were the nearest and the dearest to him. The inner circle, Peter, James, and John come with me. You stay here while I go and pray. Be praying for me because my soul is in agony and you will find that Christ actually sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. And this is not just symbolism. This really took place that out of his pores, because of his great distress, he actually had blood come forth like sweat. As he anticipated the cross, as he anticipated being separated from his heavenly Father, for the first time ever, he would be separated, and our sin, not his sin, would rest upon him. So we see his need for prayer in Matthew 26, and then when we jump to Romans 8, we see that God understands we have weakness in prayer. I won't quiz you this morning, but if I asked if you prayed every day, and I mean more than good bread, good meat, good gosh, let's eat, you know, those kind of prayers, now I lay me down to sleep. I'm talking about intense prayer, spending time with God. Yes, the quality is important, but sometimes the quantity is equally important before God, we would probably find out very quickly, and we'd all relate, that we don't spend enough time in prayer. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And we deposit large amounts of time to the things we love the most. And isn't it amazing that God wants to do great things for us, but we must ask. We have not because we ask not. Now, I'm like you. I turn on the TV sometimes. I'm thinking of canceling everything and figuring out how to get a super antenna so I can get Patriots and Red Sox without dealing with Verizon or Cox or any of those things. But I see those special advertisements that come on that break my heart. I see the children with the cleft lips you know, and I see people in third world nations that are skin and bones, and I know it's real, and I know with the music and the pictures, I am just driven to want to do something, but I know I can't do something for everyone, and I know the bulk of my finances personally goes to spiritual things, wanting to see people come to a saving knowledge so that they'll be secured for eternity. I love pets. And when I see endangered species on TV, it breaks my heart. I think the one that always gets to me is the snow leopard that has been on most recently. I just want to do something. It just breaks my heart that this created beautiful creature is going to go out of existence. It gets my attention as they seek to move me financially, to do something for that cause. But folks, I see beyond that, and I hope you do too. I live in a wicked world, and so do you. I live in a world that's gone nuts. I live in a world that is upside down. It's vile. It's sick. And I find that they need a touch of the Master. They need the Lord Jesus Christ. They need a new life in Christ. They need something supernatural to take place in their life so that their eternity might be secure. 
So I get upset, even in churches, when we major on minor things that aren't important at all, and we push aside the weightier matters of the law, as Christ put it, like prayer, God's word. We eliminate words like repentance, because that doesn't make us feel good. Forgiveness salvation and we find those kind of things almost in their own realm become endangered of going into extinction i read something silly probably now it's about 30 years ago you know when you start dating yourself and every story you repeat you realize last time you said it it was 20 years and now it's 30 years it's a little bit of a silly story it's a little bit fictitious in nature, but ultimately it's true and it should be considered. It's entitled the obituary of Mrs. Prayer Meeting. Oh yeah, that was actually her name. The obituary of Mrs. Prayer Meeting. It says Mrs. Prayer Meeting died recently at the first neglected church located on Worldly Avenue. Born many years ago into the midst of great revivals, she was a strong, healthy child. She fed largely on testimony and spiritual holiness. So growing into worldwide prominence, she was one of the most influential members in her church. But for the past several years, sister prayer meeting has been failing in health, gradually wasting away until rendered helpless by stiffening in her knees until her death was caused by inactivity and weakness of purpose and willpower. At the last, she was a mere shadow of her former self. Her last whispered words were inquiries concerning the strange absence of her loved ones. Now busy at work and places of amusement. Experts, including Dr. Works, Ruth, do you know him? Dr. Works, Dr. Reform, and Dr. Joyner, disagreed as to the cause of her fatal illness, administering large doses of organization, socials, contests, and drives, but to no avail. In honor of her untimely passing, the church doors will be closed on Wednesday nights in honor of her memory. And that is what is going on, or should I say not going on, in our churches today. I dare say if I called for an important prayer meeting this week, a very small percentage of our church would deem it important, necessary, to show up. And it's the most important thing that we do. It's hard. It's work. We're so unused to it, we run out of things to say because churches try it periodically. They dip and dabble with it. They have experimentation. Yeah, we tried that prayer thing, but it just didn't seem to take hold. There are some areas of Scripture if you're taking notes. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. 1 John 5.14 says, Now we have this confidence that if we have in him, excuse me, let me say it again, we have this confidence that if we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And then it goes on to verse 15, And if it's according to his will, we will receive what's needed. Romans 12, 12 says to be instant or constant in prayer. That means we should always be in a spirit 
and an attitude of prayer. It should not be an afterthought. It shouldn't only be a church exercise. Matthew 6, 7 talks about vain repetition and our many words. And in the Sermon on the Mount, it also talks about crawling into our prayer closets and petitioning God without anyone else knowing for things that when God comes through because we prayed in secret, he promises to bless us openly. Sometimes we pray, but we let everybody know what we're praying, hoping they'll come through and meet our need. When it is, in fact, God who wants to prove himself powerful in meeting our need. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door shall be open to you. My desire, my petition, my request is that we would try to get a little closer to this thing called prayer. That we would start working on it a little bit. I remember years ago teaching about 50 teenagers and we had an evangelist come through and come through from the south and he said, bless God, you need to pray for three hours a day. And he came in and spoke to my teenagers, telling them that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> right. You know, I couldn't find an adult to pray for three hours a day unless they fell asleep in the middle somewhere. And they'd wake up and maybe three hours had passed. So I'd look at my teens and I'd say, how many of you don't pray at all? And they're pretty honest with that stuff. They'd all start laughing and all raise their hands. I'd say, how about if you prayed starting off, I'm going to give you a real challenge for a minute, a minute a day to lift up your heart to God and say, hey, Lord, and whatever your name is, here I am. Here are my needs. Thank you for my life. I need you. How about that? How about a start? All of these grand illusions that we're going to read 30 chapters a day. Some people might do that, but I would encourage you to get started and do something so that you're reaching out to the God of the universe and creating a good habit in your life. We must ask, well, doesn't God already know what I need? Yes, but he tells us in James 4, 2, we have not because we ask not. I always use the illustration of Bartimaeus, blind, sitting outside of the city of Jericho, begging alms, food, clothing, and him crying out to Christ as Jesus went by, wanting something from him because he heard who he was. Christ had a reputation and saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the disciples telling him to be quiet. The master's busy. He doesn't have time for you. You're ruining what we're trying to do here. And yet Christ stopped, didn't he? And he said, bring him over here to me. Suddenly the disciples changed their tune. They said, oh, the master calls for you. Come ahead with us. Now they wanted to be a part of things. As Bartimaeus struggled to walk across a dirt road and they were not mindful of doing anything for the handicapped because they believed the handicapped were cursed by God. Stepping in holes, almost falling down, feeling his way across the road. When he got to Jesus, do you think Jesus really didn't know what his problem was? He knew he was blind. But Jesus said, Bartimaeus, what is it that you want from me? We'd be like, what a dumb question. You have not because you ask not. Bartimaeus didn't care. He said that I might see. And he had the faith in who Jesus was. And Jesus touched his eyes so that he could see. We need to ask. Yes, God knows what you need. But you need to get on your knees and ask. You need to petition the God of heaven. He's worthy of our time. He's worthy of our consideration. 
Jesus came back three times to the inner core and said, you're asleep again? We understand that. You ever fallen asleep doing something spiritual or godly? You know, we say, oh boy, it was so sweet last night. I started praying and I fell asleep. Next thing I knew it was morning. What a glorious moment. I don't think so. I happen to know that if I started a conversation with my wife and fell asleep in the middle of it, she would not say, oh, what a glorious event. How sweet that was. I will remember it forever. Well, she will remember it forever if I do that, and she'll talk to me about it forever. Trust me. But it won't be because it was a great occasion to bring to remembrance. The text that we read today show two things. Christ had a need. Isn't that amazing? Co-laborers together with God. Christ had a need for those he loved the most to pray for him, to encourage him, because he was scared. And he said, if it be your will, Father, take this cup from me, nevertheless your will be done, not mine. He came up to them and he loved them and he said, watch and pray because the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Couldn't we say amen to that? We want to do the right thing. But in the area of prayer and righteousness and spirituality, our flesh is weak. Why is it that we resist the things that God says helps the most? Not a good thing. And then in Romans 8, 26, God says he's familiar with our infirmities, our weaknesses, that we don't know how to pray. Ever bow your head and you're not sure how to pray because you have a delicate situation? And the best thing to do is to be quiet for a while and let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart and give you the words according to his will to pray. And when you pray according to God's will, those are the prayers that are answered. So a couple of things this morning that I want you to notice with me. First off, powerful answers. Powerful answers when we pray. Prayer which is almost extinct. Jeremiah 33.3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. Ephesians 3.20 Is it possible God could give you more than you're asking for? Is it possible he could give you something different? Then you're asking for? Is it possible that he could say, not yet? You're not ready for it at this point because he's your heavenly father and he loves you? I want to read a couple of scriptures to you. Write down 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 and 4. We are involved in spiritual warfare, whether you know it or not. And if you deny it's going on, Satan loves that just fine. What better way to be defeated to not even know you're in a battle, not even know you're in a fight? 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Carnal means fleshly. But mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. What you battle with that you would consider to be a stronghold in your life, God wants to pull it down. A rebellious child, a daughter that's beneath addiction, a loss in your life that you can't seem to deal with, loneliness, anger, being overwhelmed, opposition, being oppressed, a stronghold that through prayer God wants to pull down. But it's a spiritual battle. And if we fall asleep on the job without lifting it up to God, we will not receive the deliverance that we need. What are your needs this morning? Think about it. What's your greatest need right now? That's your stronghold 
That's your greatest need. And James 5.16 says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. A couple more verses for you to write down. Psalm 9.9, the Lord will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Nahum, Old Testament minor prophet, 1 and verse 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. Well, you need to know what was going on in Nahum. Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria. Remember Jonah? They had been spared because of the message of Jonah. Repent or you'll be destroyed. Everyone from the king to the peasant repented. And God backed off of his judgment in destroying the city. But a hundred years later, they had forgotten. And they had not passed along prayer, God's word, testimony, and things like that to the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation. And pretty soon, they didn't acknowledge God at all. And they returned to their sinful ways. And in the book of Nahum, we see Nineveh, ultimately and finally, being destroyed. And their name being erased from this world. Now, you know what? That was a terrible thing, but you know what? That scared believers too. And I think sometimes we ought to be a little scared. I think sometimes we need a little adversity. I think sometimes we need a little persecution to get us going in the right direction. Remember when the disciples were given the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? What did they do? They stayed in Jerusalem. They thought only Jews should come to Christ. They didn't want to reach Gentiles. They called Gentiles dogs. They wanted nothing to do with them. What did God do? He brought persecution to drive them out of Jerusalem so that they would do what he commanded them to do. There is a gentleman that I talked about in Sunday school and Wednesday night named Jim Cimbala. How many of you have heard of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir? Good. A good number of you. It's about 150 voices strong. They're phenomenal. Get their music. And if you would interview many of the 150, a lot of them are formal, former drug addicts. I mean, we're on at the end of their lives. Nothing to live for, nothing to hope for. And they came to Christ and they found love in this church, the Brooklyn Tab. Jim Cimbala came in 1971. God laid it on his heart and his wife's heart to start a, a church there in the Brooklyn Tab. It was a big movie theater. And it was like four movie theaters that had been crammed together like they do nowadays. It was falling apart. It was disgusting. God laid it on his heart that if anything was going to happen, it needed to begin with prayer. So he called for a prayer meeting. Fifteen to twenty people showed up. He said they stood there, they prayed for about five minutes, and then they all looked at each other. Okay, what do we do now? Because our flesh is weak, isn't it? The Spirit's willing. But he said we persevered. We kept at it. We kept coming. And he is convinced that their church was built on prayer, and they run some 10,000 people every weekend now at the Brooklyn Tabernacle, and it is a beautiful place because of prayer. I want you to watch a three-minute clip that Alan is going to put on, and uh, just consider it because it's powerful. This is Jim Cimbala speaking to his congregation. My house shall be called 
a house of prayer. And we have, in the day that we live in, a lot of revisionism going on. But it's not coming from Washington. It's coming from the church. We're revising what a church is today. The Bible says, and they continued, the early church, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, we've revised that and said, if you can get people for one hour on Sunday morning in a building, that's the church. That's not the church. We can use every device we want to get people for one hour and keep it early and keep it moving and keep it going because people have important things to do that day. That's not the story of the Christian church. That might be the story of my church or your church, but that's not the church Jesus built. And the history of revivals down through the ages have told us that whenever things have grown crass and commercial and secular and hard and worldly, God sends a revival. And what's always the sign of the revival? Behold, they pray. The church begins to pray. Moody goes somewhere in England and they begin to pray. Finney goes to upstate New York and they begin to pray. The great awakening happens in America and they begin to pray. Who was the fancy preacher? Nobody. They pray. Where was the great music? Oh, they made great psalms, but that wasn't the great thing about it. It was they prayed. Prayer preceded it. Prayer kept it going. And the minute prayer ended, the Spirit of God lifted and we got back into one of those tougher times for the church of Jesus Christ. You folks, young people who are going to these schools, let me tell you, as someone who went to college as a basketball player on a full scholarship and traveled around the country playing basketball, never had the privilege of going to a school like you folks are going to. The greatest thing anybody can learn in this building is how to pray. How to call on God so that God intervenes in a situation. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. And that's the church. And I talk to well-known ministers. I talk to men, if I mention their names, a lot of you would know a lot of their names. And they tell me privately, off the record, hey, listen, I know I'm dazzling them with my books and my sermons. But Brother Jim, something's wrong. Because except for Sunday morning, one hour, I can't get a soul into the church. If I call a prayer meeting, not one-tenth of the congregation would come. They'll pay $20 for a concert, but Jesus can't draw. They'll pay all kinds of money to hear somebody do something, and that's wonderful. I'm all for that. But doesn't it awaken us that if the prayer meeting was called, that nobody would come when God said, My house shall be called a house of prayer. My house shall be called. A house of prayer. So you would think that it's the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir that I'm lifting up, but it's not. I'm lifting up their prayer ministry, that they pray. That they believe in getting a hold of the throne of God and seeing great things happen. In the Old Testament, there were some empowered individuals called judges who would help rule Israel and help them when enemy nations came and direct them concerning the things of God. After a while, the people got tired of that. And they wanted a king because all of the enemy nations had a king. And they felt like they should have a king. Samuel did not like it. Samuel was angered by that. But God said, give them what they want. Give them the king that they desire and they will learn how wrong they've been in not embracing me as a king. God will give us what we draw to ourselves. God will allow us to do what we think is important. But Samuel, thank God, in 1 Samuel 12 and verse 23, he said this as he talked to Israel, even though he was angry at them. He said, and neither will I walk off and leave you. This is a paraphrased version. That would be a sin against God. I am staying right here at my post praying for you. 
and teaching you the good and right way to live. Another version says, be it far fetched that I would sin against God and not pray for you. Do you know if I don't pray for you, I'm sinning against God? Amen? We are commissioned to pray for each other. And if God lays it on our hearts to pray for things, but we don't have the time, and our flesh is weak, we're sinning before God. The Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. The Bible says to him that knows to do the right thing and does it not, James, to him it is sin. Well, I don't see anything, and I don't feel anything, and I'm busy. Do you really want to follow Christ? Do you really want a relationship with the God of the universe? Here the inner circle got brought to Gethsemane and they couldn't stay away. God loved them. And he understood what their problem was. It doesn't have to be long and wordy and empty. It can be simply effective. Elijah in the Old Testament to prove that there was one God in heaven had set up two altars. One that the true God was going to consume the sacrifice by fire and another altar for the 450 prophets of Baal so that their sacrifice could be consumed by fire when they called on their false god. The prophets of Baal went first. They prayed all morning long and nothing happened. They got kind of crazy and they started screaming and they started cutting themselves and doing all kinds of rituals to try to get the attention of the false god. Elijah kind of had the warped sense of humor that I have. He said, oh gee, maybe your god's asleep. Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he can't hear you. Call a little louder but their false god would not answer. Meanwhile, Elijah, prophet of God, who didn't die a natural death, he was taken home in a flaming chariot. He set up his altar, and he poured barrel after barrel of water on top of the sacrifice, on top of the wood. A trench which had been dug around the sacrifice actually filled up with water and Elijah simply said, Lord, this is for your name's sake. Lick up this sacrifice to show them there is only one God in heaven. That's all he said. He didn't scream. He didn't cut himself. He didn't put on a show. And the fire came from heaven. And it licked up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones. It even licked up all the water in the trench. One true God of heaven. And a man who was connected to God through prayer as he communicated with him. We're in a spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6.12 We're told that the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. Timothy was told to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We find also we're told to war a good warfare on our knees. Have you all seen that movie, War Room? Pretty exciting, huh? It is a war. Our flesh is weak. We need to do what's right simply because it's right. Hey, if you ever study the book of Revelation and the tribulation period, you know what's up in heaven and it's described in Revelation 5, 8 and Revelation 8, 4? The prayers of the saints. God collects them. God holds on to them. It also tells us that all our tears are in his bottle. He's aware of what we go through. And God says our prayers are like a sweet aroma to God. It's like God's in heaven going, oh, I'm going to answer that. That's wonderful. Do you pray like that? Do you believe that way? Do you do it simply because it's right? 
In 1 Chronicles 4, verses 9 and 10, and we're almost at the end here, there was a man named Jabez. How many have bought the little book, The Prayer of Jabez? Anybody read that? You know, Barbara. You know, you ought to get that book and read it. Jabez was a man in the Old Testament in 1 Chronicles 4, 9 and 10. Guess what his name meant? Pain. My mom named me Pain. Apparently, he had given his mom much pain in childbirth. We don't know all the details. So she said, you know what? I'm going to name him Pain. So she did. He grew up. He probably was teased and ridiculed because of that. And we find in 1 Chronicles, in the midst of boring genealogies. Do you think genealogies are boring? Born, lived, died. Born, lived, died. Born, lived, died. You know your life is just a dash, right? On that gravestone. Kind of boring. In the midst of reading those genealogies, it suddenly lifts up the name of Jabez. And it says, Jabez was more noble than his brethren. And he cried out to God with a prayer request. In the midst of boring stuff, he thought it was a good time to pray. He said, bless me indeed. Enlarge my coast, meaning strengthen my limitations, the areas where I'm weak. Let your strong right arm be with me. Keep me from harm. Keep me from evil. And you know what God did? God went. God answered his prayer and gave him everything he prayed for in the craziest of circumstances. Genealogies, boring stuff, where we think nothing could happen and we're just trying to get through. You ever sit somewhere and you just want to get through because it's so stinking boring? I hope it's not now. I really do. I'll tell you what, folks. Prayer can be powerful. What kind of prayers can we pray? Well, a prayer of help, Jabez. A prayer of salvation. Remember Jonah in the stomach of that great fish? Salvation is of the Lord. Get me out of here. Jonah chapter 2. Hannah, 1 Samuel 2, praising God. Deliverance, David, Psalm 3. What prayer does God want to inhale from you as a sweet aroma? this morning. You know this prayer. You know this verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto thy own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your paths through prayer. What God's will is. What God's direction is. What our own weaknesses are. And here's what amazes me the most. We start off in our text, Christ wanting prayer in the garden. Romans 8, 26, knowing that we're weak in prayer. And then suddenly in John, the 17th chapter, read it when you go home or tonight. It's the high priestly prayer of Christ. You know, Jesus prays for you. Isn't that wonderful? He prays for you. And he says some things that will wake us up. He says, Father, I'm not asking that you take them out of the world. They're needed there. But keep them from the evil. Help them to do what I've called them to do. I love you folks. And there are some folks even in this room that if I had a prayer request, I'd call you up and I'd say, would you pray for me? But there's nothing better than Jesus praying. Amen? Shouldn't we be prayer warriors if the Son of God is praying for us presently? And he devoted an entire chapter in his word showing how he prays for you and I. Hey folks, has prayer become an endangered species? In your heart, in your family, in our church, we have to repent. Amen? We have to repent. We have to set up memorials. We must wholeheartedly seek after God. Well, I'm very busy. 
just what I do sometimes, not so much anymore, but I'll be transparent and confess to you. I could lay on the couch and watch Seinfeld reruns forever. Oh, that's important stuff. You know what's even funnier? I got them all memorized. But I'll watch them anyway, because I've got to see Kramer's facial expression. I've got to see all the funny things, how they go on and how they happen. Sometimes I lay there and I glance over at my Bible, where something crosses my mind that I should pray for. But I'm kind of fatigued. I'm laying on the couch. I've taken on the shape of the couch. Come see my couch. There's a divot that is shaped like me. I'm busy. Do you do some stuff that you consider to be busy work and it's laziness? And we should be given some time to prayer. You have not because you ask not. We're going to be pushing a lot of prayer ventures in our church. We do our prayer challenge every morning at 9 o'clock in the fellowship hall. Uh, Linda's handling that. There's different topics, verses to be read every week. If you want to hear about that, if you're not aware of what we're doing, make sure you see Linda. She sang the special this morning. Find out what you can do. I get up and I'm just, you know, pointed enough to say, who looked at the prayer list this week even one day? Because I don't want to assume that everyone's doing it. Are you praying? Am I praying? Do we believe that the spiritual things will help everything, our family, our job, our life, our emotions, our relationships? Is prayer real? Does it work? Is it just here, but it hasn't made it down into our hearts? God wants to change all that. God wants to transform us. I have met kids that are 10 years old that love to pray. I've met teenagers that love to pray. That's why I used to do youth camps. I'd meet some really godly kids. They didn't start out godly, but they came to Christ. We should be known as a church that prays and sees results because it's for his name's sake when we lift up the name of Christ. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Heads bowed and eyes closed for a moment. I never attempt to play the Holy Spirit of God that I know what's going on in your mind, in your heart, and what decisions need to be made. If you have received Christ as Savior, he lives in you. The Holy Spirit right now might be jabbing you with his godly finger and saying, this is you. This is your need. This is why you don't have what you need. This is why your family's struggling. This is why you're having problems. I want you to be a prayer warrior. I want you to trust me. I want you to crawl into your prayer closet and start petitioning the God of heaven. Maybe that's you today, and by an uplifted hand, you'd say, please keep me in prayer. My prayer needs attention. My prayer life. Pray for me today. Hands all over. Amen. Anybody else? Pray for me. My prayer life needs attention. I see your hand, brother. I see your hand, dear lady. I see your hand, ladies. My prayer life needs attention. I need greater faith. I throw up some prayers sometimes when I'm in trouble. I see your hand, dear lady. I see your hand, dear lady. I see your hand, dear lady. I throw some prayers up. I know how to pray. But sometimes they're not effectual. They're not fervent. God wants to hear from you. He loves you. He wants to work miracles in our lives. But we have not because we ask not. Maybe you're here today and you might say, Pastor, I'm not sure I know Christ the Savior. And by my uplifted hand, I just want to let you know I'm concerned about that. I don't know where I'd go if I died today. Pray for me. Anyone like that today? 
most important question we ask at first. Do you know Christ as Savior? Have you been born again? Pray for me. I don't mind lingering on that question. Pray for your lost family members. Pray for the folks on your job who don't know Christ. God wants to give you exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. Father, we all struggle with this thing called prayer. And you give us the perfect example by Peter, James, and John falling asleep repeatedly. But Lord God, they became prayer warriors at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit of God came. We have the Spirit of God if we have received Christ as Savior. And we know that the Spirit of God that lives within us wants to pray, wants to glorify Jesus. We see it in John 16, right before we get to the high priestly prayer. Lord, might we glorify you by first off talking to you and lifting up other people to you. Change our attitudes, our perception. Change our understanding of the battle. Help us to realize it will be won on our knees. Help us not to be weary in well-doing. But in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Help us to keep praying. We ask it in Christ's name for his sake. Amen. Amen.